This screencast is going to introduce atomic orbitals and orbital hybridization to a level appropriate for our first year organic chemistry module. So fundamentally chemistry is all about the behavior of electrons and orbitals are where we store electrons. So we have this classical image of a nucleus with the electrons whizzing around it um, but this is not exactly an accurate picture. So because of wave particle duality electrons can behave as both a particle and a wave. So actually a more accurate representation of how electrons behave around a nucleus would be as a cloud of probability density. So the deeper the colour the more likely you are at a specific point in time to find an electron in that area. So you can see it gets lighter the further away you get from the atom which tells you you've got less chance of finding an electron over here compared to close to the nucleus down here. Now these clouds of probability density are what we call orbitals. Atomic orbitals are orbitals which are situated on an atom and fundamentally they come in four different flavours if you like, S, P, D and F. S orbitals are perfectly spherical, they're essentially shaped like a football and we can represent that like this. So this is a three-dimensional spherical shape, it's not just circular. There's one s orbital per energy level, but more on that in a moment. p orbitals are shaped like a dumbbell or a figure of eight. You can see that they're symmetrical around the axis in which they're pointing, um, but they have these two lobes uh, which are in opposite phases. And again, we'll come back to that in a moment. But there are three p orbitals per energy level, and they point in the Cartesian coordinates. So pz, py, and px. So you can see that they're all mutually orthogonal to each other. They're all pointing at 90 degrees relative to each other. Um, note that the py in this case is pointing into and out of the screen. Now, d orbitals have more complex shapes and there's five of those per energy level. And f orbitals have even more complex shapes and there's seven of those per energy level. But for the purposes of this video, we're not gonna come across them. And generally in organic chemistry, we don't tend to come across them uh, too often. Uh, that's just because we don't use elements which are heavy enough to contain them. So if we look at our energy level, our principal quantum number, essentially what we're going to do here is construct the periodic table. So if we look at which subshells are contained in each energy level, um, in energy level 1 we only have an S subshell, in energy level 2 we have S and P, in energy level 3 we have S, P and D, and in energy level 4 we have S, P, D and F. So because each orbital can only hold two electrons, there's a limit of the number of electrons we can hold in each shell, therefore. So we can hold two electrons in energy level one because we only have a single s orbital to hold them in, and each orbital can hold two electrons. If we go to energy level two, we've now got eight electrons, and that's because we've got two in the s orbital, and we've got six in the p orbitals. Remember, there are three p orbitals, px, py, and pz. And if we go on through energy levels 3 and 4, we go up to 18 and 32 electrons because we've now got increasing numbers of orbitals. And this is essentially how the periodic table is constructed. So if we start with the lightest element, hydrogen, hydrogen has an uh, electronic configuration of 1s1. So its energy level 1s subshell contains one electron. If we then go to helium, it's 1s2. And we essentially fill uh, by going down this diagram from top to bottom. So as we go down, we go 1s2, 2s1, we're now into this subshell, 2s2, we're now starting to fill the 2p subshell, and so on. And this is basically how the periodic table is constructed. Now this is why I say we don't come across D and F orbitals very often, because in organic chemistry we're mostly dealing with carbon, and also hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and some of the halides. So the, the key orbitals that we're dealing with are mainly S and P. Now each orbital is described by what's called a radial distribution function, which is a mathematical equation which describes uh, where the electrons are going to be in that orbital, or where they're likely to be. So if we take our nucleus here, and across the x-axis we have distance from the nucleus, and across the y-axis we have the probability of finding an electron when squared. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. So if we were to draw a radial distribution function which looked like this, then if we square the y-axis and we rotate this through 360 degrees to make it a three-dimensional shape, we would end up with something that was spherical that looked like this. So you've got a high probability of finding an electron close to the nucleus, which drops away quite precipitously until you get to this point, and then you have no chance of finding an electron outside of this. And that's basically giving our orbital a shape. 
So this radial distribution function describes an s orbital, a spherical orbital where you've got a higher chance of finding an electron close to the nucleus, which then drops off as you get towards the edge. Now you can also draw an s orbital radial distribution function which looks like this. Now the important part of the equation is that you square the axis, so there's never a negative probability of finding an electron. So this still gives us something that has a positive chance of finding an electron close to the nucleus and which drops away as you get further towards the edge. But what this does is changes the phase of the, uh, the orbital. So it also describes an s orbital but in the opposite phase. So the way that I describe these uh, is as kind of coloured in if you like and as white. So this will become important later on when we start making molecular orbitals but for now you just need to know that an s orbital can exist as either of these two phases. If our radial distribution function looks like this, where it crosses the x-axis at zero, this is called a node, then what we end up with, if we square the y-axis again and rotate through 360 degrees, is an orbital which looks like this. And this looks familiar because this is a p-orbital. And you can see in a p-orbital that you've got both phases in the same orbital. So one half is white and one half is coloured in. Now, if we were to reverse the, um, the equation, so I'll just flip back and forth between those two. Then obviously you end up with the opposite phase of the p orbital. So these are analogous to how we did the s orbital. You can have the p orbital in both of these phases as well. But the thing about p orbitals is you've got both phases in the same orbital. It's just that they're switched over. Now, if we want to form bonds with s and p atomic orbitals as they are. So let's take a carbon atom. Uh, we've got an s orbital, which is spherical. And we've got the px, the py, and the pz orbitals. So let's start forming some bonds to these orbitals. So we're going to form a bond to the px orbital like this, and then we'll form a bond to the uh, py orbital. Now these two are obviously now at 90 degrees to each other, because that's the orientation the orbitals are in. The pz orbital, again, mutually at 90 degrees, so we've got 90 degree bond angles between all these three substituents. And we've then got to form our fourth bond to this s orbital. So we'll just cram it in wherever it'll fit. Now, does this look like any depiction of a molecule that we've ever seen in organic chemistry? Well, not really, because all single bonded carbon is tetrahedral, uh, double bonded carbon is trigonal, trigonal planar, and triple bonded carbon is linear. So nowhere do we get these 90 degree bond angles. So in tetrahedral, bond angles are 109.5 degrees. So something's not quite right here. So what we have to do instead is hybridize our orbitals. And this is what atoms do to essentially get the best of both worlds. You get the low energy of the s orbital and the directionality of the p orbitals. And it also makes your orbitals degenerate or equivalent in energy, which stops you having very strangely shaped molecules. So if we were to um, mix these orbitals together, which is essentially what hybridization is, there's a number of ways we could do it. We could mix everything. So we mix the s orbital with all three of the p orbitals. We could mix the s orbital with two of the p orbitals, which leaves one of the p orbitals left over. Um, and it doesn't matter which two orbitals you pick out of the p orbitals, they're all degenerate, they've all got the same energy. So picking these two is the same as picking these two. Or we could mix one s and one p orbital and leave two p orbitals left over. Those are the three different ways we can mix orbitals in this process called hybridization. So, one rule to, to bear in mind when you're mixing orbitals, whether it's atomic orbitals or later when we get onto molecular orbitals, is the number of orbitals you mix into the process has to equal the number of orbitals which come out. You can't create or destroy matter. So you've got to do a little, little check. The number of orbitals you mix must equal the number of orbitals out. So if we mix one, X, one uh, S orbital with a number of P orbitals, we will get a number of hybridized orbitals out. So let's start with that first situation that we had of mixing everything together. So we're mixing one s orbital with three p orbitals. So one plus three gives us four orbitals which needs to come out of this. So we're getting four sp3 hybridized orbitals. So where this comes from is you're mixing one s with three p orbitals. So sp3 is what we call this hybridization mode. And sp3 hybridized orbitals look like this. They're essentially an average of what you've put into it. And 
This looks familiar because this is a tetrahedral geometry. So this is how all single bonded carbon works. This is sp3 hybridization. Now if we look at the energy levels of these orbitals, I've just got energy up a, an arbitrary y-axis here, then our s-atomic orbital is very low in energy, whereas our p orbitals are much higher in energy. And like I said before, they're all degenerate. They've all got the same energy. So if we're mixing everything together, what we end up with is four orbitals, which are now degenerate. They've all got the same energy, but they are 75% p character. So you've mixed three p orbitals and one s orbital. So therefore, that's 75% p character, 25% s character, if you like. So the energy of the resulting orbitals that you get out is 75% of the way towards p, um, or 25% of the way towards s, if you like. So it's, it's basically a weighted average of the energy of the orbitals that went into making it. Now, because we've hybridized these orbitals, we get rid of the unhybridized S and P orbitals. So our atomic orbital structure for an sp3 hybridized carbon is this. We have four degenerate sp3 hybridized atomic orbitals. So if we now take a look at our second situation where we're mixing one S orbital with two P orbitals, we're now putting three orbitals in, so we should get three orbitals out. And these are called sp2 hybridized orbitals because you've got one s and two p going into making it. Now sp2 hybridized orbitals look like this. Um, again, they're an average of whatever you put in. Um, and this looks familiar because this is the shape of our trigonal planar. And so this is sp2 hybridized carbon. Now remember, we've still got an unhybridized p orbital left over which is uh, mutually orthogonal to the plane of these ones. So uh, the two p orbitals that you mixed in uh, to form this trigonal planar arrangement, this is the one that's at 90 degrees to them both. So it'll be sticking out of the plane like this. And when we come to uh, make uh, molecular orbitals and form bonds, it's this unhybridized p orbital that's going to form this double bond over here. So these unhybridized p orbitals are really useful for forming these uh, double and later triple bonds. So if we have a look at the energy diagram for this, um, again, here's our unhybridized atomic orbitals, same as we had before. We're now mixing two of these p orbitals with one of these s orbitals. So we're ending up with three degenerate uh, or orbitals, which are sp2 hybridized. And now they're 66.6% .6 p character, because they're two thirds p, if you like, because two out of the three orbitals you put in were p. So they're 66.6% .6 of the way towards p orbitals in energy uh, and 33.3% towards s. But we've still got this unhybridized atomic orbital up here. Um, so that obviously doesn't change in energy because it's not mixed with anything. So it stays exactly where it is. And we've got this p atomic orbital, which is higher in energy than the sp2 orbitals. So if we get rid of the, uh, the mixing, then what we're left with is the electronic or the sorry, the orbital structure of an sp2 hybridized uh, atom. So we've got three degenerate orbitals that are lower in energy, which are sp2, and one orbital which is higher in energy, which is our unhybridized p orbital. So if we look at the final example now, just mixing one s and one p orbital together, we're mixing one s orbital, one p orbital, so we're getting two hybridized orbitals out, and these are called sp hybridized orbitals because they're now 50-50. So these are linear, because again, they're an average of the shapes of the, the orbitals that went into making them. And this is reminiscent of our triple bonded carbon over here. So we've got a linear arrangement between these two uh, substituents. We've then got two unhybridized p orbitals left over. And these are the ones that are mutually orthogonal to this, uh, this plane here. So these are the ones that go that direction and that direction. So if we look at our energy diagram. So now we're just mixing one of each. So because they're 50-50, then they are 50% p character and 50% s character. So they're halfway in energy between the s and the p orbitals that went into making them. And again, they're both degenerate in energy. We've then got the two unhybridized p orbitals which didn't undergo a change, so they stay where they are. Um, so we've now got this uh, orbital configuration where you've got two orbitals which are lower in energy, and they are sp hybridized orbitals, and you've got two orbitals which are higher in energy, 
and then you're, they're your unhybridized p atomic orbitals. So this is the orbital structure of sp hybridized atoms. So just to summarize, We've covered the three uh, hybridization modes. Uh, most commonly, we'll see these applied to carbon. So sp3 hybridized carbon uh, has four equivalent orbitals, which forms four uh, bonds to four substituents. This is tetrahedral. Uh, we've got sp2 hybridized carbon, which forms a trigonal planar arrangement between the substituents. Uh, and then we've got the possibility of forming an additional bond. So this, uh, this extra double bond, if you like, which is from the unhybridized p orbital. And then we've got sp hybridized carbon, uh, which forms a linear arrangement, and we've got the possibility of forming two bonds to two substituents, and then two additional bonds. Um, and we'll come on to those in a later video about forming molecular orbitals.